Hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 799, that is Siete Nuevo Nuevo of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. Hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. I hope you're doing great. How am I? All good, all things considered, I'm not going to lie. I've done my facials. I'm about to do my workout after I finish this recording this podcast. And I'm also fitting into this jersey that I was a little bit fat for maybe a few weeks back. Um, actually, a few months back, actually. Let me not lie. A few months back, I went on a bit of a buying spree. I went on a bit of a buying spree. I went on a bit of a buying spree on the old Vinted and bought loads of jerseys, loads of American football jerseys, also known as NFL jerseys that I could wear and from time to time because I like how they fit. I liked how baggy they are. I liked how unitarian they are. I liked how versatile they are. And it matched my kind of style that I was kind of going for for the summer. Obviously, the summer has kind of been and gone. I haven't really been outside for the most part. So, um, and I've also got this weird thing when it comes to clothes. It might be a bit of trauma. It might just be a habit. But when I grew up, it was kind of frowned upon to wear your new thing straight away. You didn't want to wear the stuff that you bought straight away because it made it seem like you didn't have anything before you bought what you bought to wear. Even though that's dumb because when you're buying stuff, you're obviously buying it to wear, but you could never wear it on the same day. You'd have to at least leave it for like a week or something. But now I've got into that habit so much that I sometimes will buy things and I'll forget about them. I've got like Supreme hoodies, t-shirts i've got like pants i've bought new jackets i've never worn still in my wardrobe so from time to time when i want to mix up what i want to wear and stuff or i want to just wear something that i haven't worn because usually these last few months um i've just been living in black t-shirts oversized ones that i bought like in you know in bulk from amazon or from like you know printing shop factories and stuff and i want to mix it up and wear something different i'll look at my wardrobe and i'll be like oh i remember you I remember buying you and then I put it on. I'm like, wow, I knew I bought this for a reason. It fits pretty well. But I also remember when I first bought this, I did try it on and it was a little bit tight on me. And this is like an XL. So imagine me being the, um, being the inner, being, having the inner waif in me, my inner twink was like, no, nah, I can't, I can't go out with the football jersey that looks like my body is pressing against it. When I think of a football jersey, I think of it being loose. I think of it being a little bit baggy. So this is fitting a bit loose. It's still not where I want it to be, but it's getting there. So I'm happy about that. So slowly but surely, the weight is trickling down to the point where I become sample size. What I want is to become like Saint Laurent sample size. If you know, you know, I want to become Hedy Slimane sample size. Once I'm so Hedy Slimane sample size, we're gone. We're, we're, we're already lead, leading where we need to lead. I could obviously go the Ozempic route, but obviously, you know me, I like to do things the hard way. I'm about proving things to myself. I'm about looking better than other people. So if I can lure the other people's heads that I, you know, killed myself and went through weeks and weeks of training and really strict dieting and making sure I'm sleeping at the right time and intensity of my workouts and variety and analyzing my numbers and then quadrupling down on things and taking things away and blah 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 if I can hold other people's heads who've just taken a shot in the stomach I'm gonna do it I'm gonna be so proud of the fact that oh yeah no 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 no, no. while you were flipping stabbing your stomach right I was out there doing flipping burpees. I was out there doing Turkish get-ups. I was out there doing push presses, d dumbbell, you know, de deadlifts or dumbbell overhands of dumbbell overheads, whatever. I was there in the field putting that work in. That's why my body looks this way. So I'm happy about that. But little by little, the clothes are fitting good. Everything is feeling fine. But the only sad thing to start off the podcast with is obviously the unfortunate loss in the Euros by England against Spain. Now, most of you won't be surprised. Most of you who actually watch football won't be surprised that we lost. But I am absolutely heartbroken. I'm not going to lie. Mostly because it's a, you know, it's tournament football. It's tournament football. Anything can happen. And there was a scenario, in my opinion, there was a scenario, in my opinion, where England could have won. Obviously, it would have required Spain to make mistakes it would have required England to play out of our skins and not make many mistakes. But the fact that we made a bunch of mistakes, they capitalized on probably two of them. Um, and then they also played very well, despite some of their injuries and maybe not being at full tilt, was a real concern for me as a United, for me, for me as an England fan. 
because it went to prove that although this is a really good crop of players I still think the combination of the players was all wrong personally I feel like the formation was all wrong the tactics were a bit over the, all over the place just the intent in the games um, not to really go for it was a little bit annoying for me considering the talent we had available but regardless you can't besmirch it too much because Gareth Southgate did get us to a final so he did figure that bit out I just feel like what that game reflected to me was the clear gap in golf in class the golfing quality is just crazy. And that probably isn't going to be made up by tactics. I don't think so. I just think the players that these other big nations have to call from are just so much better than what we have. There's just no real competing with it, really and truly. Because you have to also imagine Spain beat us in this Euro final, not playing their best, I don't think, and also without Gabri and Pedro. Or Gadri, Gabi and Pedri, sorry. Imagine what they would have done to us with those two players. Imagine what they were done to those two players. They also did this with having Rodri go up as an injured player who was voted the player of the tournament, who I think was good, don't get me wrong, but I think there were other players in the Spain team that probably played better than him, one obviously being Nico Williams. But regardless, these players all had to, two of the players who, could, who probably would start in Gabi and Pedri weren't there. Rodri got injured in the first half. So you'd think that would put the, the onus and the momentum of the game in our favour and it didn't change anything. It really didn't. The first half I thought was very nervous, very touchy from both camps. I thought if anything, maybe Spain had a little bit, they may have edged the first half purely based on whenever they got the ball, you felt like they were in control of what they were doing. I felt like whenever we got the ball, we were reacting off of the spaces that they were giving us. I felt like Spain were trying to move us around. They were trying to do what Spain classically do. They, you know, lull us into a false sense of security. And once we start pressing and getting a little bit cocky and getting a little bit like, like today's call without pressing and doing the whole like United thing where you're kind of pressing spaces instead of pressing the person, bang, the ball goes over the top. And then quick couple of one-twos, they're already in on goal. That was the most concerning thing for me. But I was still thinking, because there's a cup final, most times in cup finals, you don't really have to play well to win them. You just have to win them whether, by hook or crook, whether it's an own goal, whether it's a goal against play, whatever. If you can scum a flipping win in a cup final, it still counts. It still counts. But we obviously didn't score in the first half. We didn't look like we were about to score. We had that one chance with, um, what's his name, Phil Foden at the back post. Very hard volley, to be fair. It was coming across his body, bending out, and he had to stretch on his left foot and try and get it on target, which he did. But still, by the time it was moving away from his body, it was hard to generate any power. And the ball itself didn't come with any real power to kind of redirect it. But again, a decent chance nonetheless. But the thing that was concerning me the most in that first half, I'm not going to lie, it felt like we were playing with nine players. I look at someone like a Luke Shaw. I look at someone like a Harry Kane. I think to myself, what are you doing on the pitch? Luke Shaw in particular, who I have a particular hate boner for, because I feel like as an, he gets away with murder as a football player because he's English. I feel like if Luke Shaw was black, if Luke Shaw was European, there's no way, there's no way he stays at United for this long with that kind of injury record that he has. The fact that he's still at the club now and he hasn't played since February is a crime in itself because look at the season going forward. We don't have a fit, fully fit, ready to go left back, ready to go, you know? I don't think so. I think Malash should just come back into training. He's been missing for a while. I'm guessing it was an injury. I'm guessing, but it could be something else happening off the pitch. Who knows? But we don't really have a fit forward, a fit left back to play in that position. So playing Luke Shaw at that fullback position, which I can understand if you're Gareth Southgate, because that left-hand side, we don't really get any joy out of it when you're playing Kieran Trippier, who's like a right-back, right, a right-footed right-back playing in the left side. If it's not really going to work. And plus, he's going to be more defensive. He's not going to worry about going forward. So I understood why he would decide to make the wild call and play Luke Shaw because in the last few games, Luke Shaw has come on as a sub <clears throat> and offered that space where he kind of occupies that position. He stands in a position where left back should be. So theoretically, that maybe opens the pitch up. But in this particular game, he was obviously more worried about um, Yamal on that side, which is understandable. But he also reminded me why he's been so disappointing as a fullback, despite his early promise. After that injury, maybe, he's never been the same player. He doesn't really progress up the flanks. He doesn't really look enthusiastic to attack. He's not looking for a chance to nick the ball and run forward. He's a complete opposite of a Cucurella. Cucurella might, know, not, might not be. I don't think this is true, but 
let's just say Cucurella might not even be more technically gifted than Luke Shaw but he has that enthusiasm he has that gumption that guile to try and get in front of his attacker and nick the ball and then try and you know progress the play up forward and Luke Shaw just doesn't do that so whenever the ball was going at that side I felt like there was nothing really happening there was no outlet there was no like overlapping runs and I can't actually think of one moment where he did make an overlapping run that was concerning then the other concern for me was Harry Kane I honestly, it's so sad to see it happen in real time because I don't think Harry Kane is even that old. He might be 31, 32 in football age, which is not that old, especially as a striker. And he's never, he was never, I thought, a striker that relied on his pace. I don't think Harry Kane ever relied on his pace. He always relied on his football intelligence. And that football intelligence is kind of like the quickness of thought and stuff to figure out what to do with the ball before the ball gets to you. Almost like a, a bigger, more stronger, muscular version of of Teddy Sheringham, in a way, right? Maybe Teddy Sheringham had better finishing ability, especially the type of finishes that he did over the years. But I thought Harry Kane was still a decent option up front. And considering that we have Ollie Watkins and Ivan Tony on the bench, I would think playing Harry Kane, him being the leader, him being the captain, and him being able to maybe influence the game early on and maybe score a goal that only Harry Kane can score and then substituting him off is going to be okay. But unfortunately for Harry Kane, he was playing in this game and the opposing nine or the opposing striker was Alvaro Morata, who I think they're quite similar in how they play. Alvaro Morata might even be slower than Harry Kane. And Alvaro Morata put on an absolute striker's clinic with how he played. He was so good for Spain without doing much. He just acted as a good point man. He'd come short, he'd play the ball in the midfield, he'd spin back around, drag that defender, make that space open, allow the midfield to progress. He'd be in the box causing a nuisance. And for some reason, I don't know what happened in this particular game. I thought Gay's been brilliant this whole tournament. But for some reason, he had Gay on skates. There was a couple of moments where he spun the ball around Gay, being really tight to him, spun the ball around him. And even though Gay, you think, is a little bit more cons physical, a little bit more athletic, just well-rounded, stronger... He was able to get in front of him. Maybe that speedness of thought. So the contrast of seeing Alvaro Morata playing much better than Harry Kane up front and then also seeing Harry Kane do things that Harry Kane don't usually do. Harry Kane, when the ball comes to his feet outside of the box, you know nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten is a shot on goal. But he's very quick with it. There was one instance where I felt like you could see, oh shit, the age is coming to him because he, you could tell what he wanted to do, but he just didn't do it quick enough. And by the time he, he did get the shot off, I think Rodri came in with a slide tackle, which is what the slide tackle led to his injury, actually. I think when he clattered into another player and he kind of hyperextended his knee during the clattering. But I think a Harry Kane of old would have either got a shot away before Rodri slid in or he would have chopped the, chopped the ball back on his left and then tried to hit it that way. Didn't happen. And that was, I think, a little bit alarming. But still, we went into the, second, the first half or the second half. We ended the first half 0-0. Second half starts. And I don't know what happened in the dressing room, but I felt like as soon as the second half started, our energy levels dipped. I don't know if that first half I wasn't paying attention and the players were running around a lot more, chasing the ball, trying to get the ball back off of Spain. It didn't really look like it, to be fair, but maybe that was the case or maybe the fatigue of the entire tournament or the season before finally caught up to a lot of those players because the energy levels just dropped and we suddenly dropped five to ten yards and that gave Spain all the encouragement. And like a top team, they smelled, they smelled our fear and they went for it. And as soon as they went for it, one of their most dangerous players throughout the entire game, Nico Williams, who was phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Nico Williams, was, that's like a high-level winger. Number one, you don't see those wingers anymore that will hug the touchline and just run at you. And also, my thing that I love mostly about Nico Williams, decision-making process. His decision-making, his brain, pause. For that level of a player, his IQ is crazy. Because usually that level of like decision making, or most of the, forget decision making, that, yeah, that level of decision making for a player like him, who's as flashy and, you know, has a, that attacking instincts is not usual. Loads of players that have those attacking, flashy, dribbly, I'm going to embarrass you type of tendencies don't usually have good IQ. It's just mostly about, okay, let me get, the, let me get a good clip for the highlight reel. But he seems to always make the right decision. Apart from some of the crossfield balls that he did that were a bit wayward, I didn't really enjoy those. But when he's in the final third, in, invariably, he always makes a bad decision. But the thing I like about him the most is his finishing in front of goal. It's so clinical. 
When that ball came across the pitch, when the ball came across the box, he was gonna, there was no shadow. You knew he was going to bang finish into give up any chance. He was obviously a great shot stopper, but gave him no chance to react. He actually added more power, came off, and sent the guy high. Oh no. Nico Williams was on fire, I thought. He played watch, He played much better now. Maybe Luke did a good amount. Maybe Yamash didn't show up. I'm sure what kind of thing. But regardless, Nico Williams was the one. The fact that they've got two, and they can have one have an off game. And even Yamal, he kind of had an off game, but he still, if I'm not mistaken, was responsible for a couple of things. He had a good shot on target in the second half, like he was still an, a, a threat. But Nico Williams, man, that performance, the way he faced up to Kyle Walker, I knew we were in trouble. The moment he got the ball out on the left-hand side and he just started facing up to Kai Walker and started like shimmying and started like flapping in the air, dropping his shoulder, treating Kai Walker like some kid he's playing with a power league or something. I thought, oh no, he's not, imp he's not impressed, bro. He's not intimidated by Kai Walker's aura. He doesn't care. He was really giving Kai Walker the business the entire half. Then he switched and went and, give Kyle and, went and, get and gave Luke Shaw the business, which is a good little battle, I'm not going to lie. But still, Nico Williams was so impressive. So impressive. And then, of course, as the game goes on, as the game goes on, as the game goes on, you start to feel that we're not going to get anywhere. And I was thinking, me personally, I would have made the change as soon as Spain scored. Because Spain scored maybe, if I'm not mistaken, Spain may have scored on like the 47th minute, the first goal. What was it? Yeah, there we go. Nico Williams, 47th minute. Because by then, you know already Harry Kane is over it. Get Ollie Watkins or Ivan Tony in. And if it was me too, I would have got Foden off and brought on, um, what you call it, um, Cole Palmer. Maybe I would have taken on Mayno off also and brought on Colin Gallagher and just kind of, you know, stiffened and solidified the midfield a little bit. That's what I would have done immediately as soon as Nico Williams scored a goal, we should have made a change to solidify our team. It may be after five minutes when we kind of settled the game down and we weren't at threat because he did a second goal. There was a need for that. We didn't really go for it. Anyway, that, that doesn't happen as fast as I want it to happen. It does eventually happen. Those subs do eventually happen. Oli Watkins and Carl Palmer come on. And the big difference, obviously... Is, is, is Carl Palmer. Oli Watkins did make a difference because he's running behind. He's stretching the defenders. But I thought the Spain defenders, you know, did very well against us in the air, on the ground, over the top. They had no problems. Lenormand was probably unlucky to get substituted. Um, Laporte was comfortable. I don't think we disturbed them at all. Cucurella was all over all over Saka, but still I thought Saka played very, 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 very well against him. But I thought for the most part, he was really on it and offering obviously more of a threat going the other way and Saka wasn't really tracking back too much. But as soon as Cole Palmer came on, the court, like that's what we need. I think the, 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 the problem with England is, I don't think we have good tactics or whatever, approach, style of play, whatever, when it comes to a game. So that's the case. I think it's probably important to get the players on the pitch with the big personalities and also get the players on the pitch who are better for the overall team success. So sometimes it might mean, even if you think Foden is a better player than Cole Palmer, because he's got a bigger personality and he's a better fit for the team, you bring on Cole Palmer. Because Cole Palmer and Bellingham, even though people have a lot of things to say bad about Bellingham, they are brave. They're going to request and demand the ball in spaces where other people won't, which then will force the players to pass it to them, which then may kind of bring about a, a chance because they might do a spin, they might do a turn, they might do a ball over the top, a flick that would never to be open things up because also when they're the best players and, they've, and they're the most frightening and they're the most lethal, usually the opposition are going to rush to them. So you might take out two or three players. I happened with Bellingham a couple of times. Defenders rushed through him, he turned. Even the, the turn was a bit collapsed. Like you took out three players. So we need that. So I think now going forward, I would love that. I'd love a mixture of like, okay, let's pick the players with the biggest personalities who are brave and who are also the best players for the team. Because this whole thing about picking the best individual things is wash. And this thing about picking players based on their form is also wash because it doesn't happen because we've got favourites. Harry Maguire, if he was fit, would have went to the Euros. The same with flipping um, Luke Shaw. If they could pass Harry Maguire fitness test, he would have gone. Luke Shaw was injured for the majority of the group stages, plays in knockouts, offers absolutely nothing, nothing, I think so, and still gets a runner-up medal. Pointless. Whereas I think like in the midfield, 
we still didn't like the Mano thing we figured out along the way I think we should have figured out the Mano thing sooner maybe we should have maybe even tried Wharton as a like as a partner for Rice in the midfield maybe that would have helped Rice to kind of go a bit further and not have to do the whole defensive role and also try to be the person progressing the ball forward that might have helped but regardless of all that we have to give Spain their flowers. Spain dominated. Spain were amazing. But regardless, Cole Palmer comes on, changes the game, scores an incredible goal. Incredible goal for me personally. Because I think having played football, I'm sure some of you guys would agree also, having played football at my low level at Sunday League, there's nothing sweeter than somebody being able to finish a shot from outside the box with their side foot. Maybe the only thing close to that is a, is a grass cutter volley on a half volley. Bang! And it just like skids across the grass and then it goes in the bottom corner. That might be the only thing that smells more sweeter than being able to generate power and accuracy and curl into a side foot shot from outside the box. And he did that. Left foot shot, tw 25 or so yards. Bang! Bottom corner. I'm going ballistic on the stream. Going crazy. That's probably why you can hear my voice is completely gone and shot. I'm going nuts. I'm so happy because I know it's a final and it's moments yes we haven't played that great yes probably Spain deserved to win but there's no deserving in finals finals are about moments you get your moment and you take it we took our moment in that instance I'm happy I'm over the moon cool but then we'd make the mistake that we well, that you don't make in those type of games especially against a nation as good as Spain we took a step back we took a step back we took our fourth to the pedal we started to defend we started to, it almost felt like the players were going for extra time. A little bit, a little bit, the vibe. I don't know what it was. Maybe they were confident about the penalties in the previous round. I don't know. I was very concerned why they were doing that. And then, of course, Spain smelled blood. They made some substitutions. They took off Rodri, I think, before the goal and put on the guy, um, what's his name? They took off Rodri and they put on Zubi Mendy. By the way, Zubi Mendy, I don't know much about the guy. I don't watch much La Liga. But I saw some people on social media basically celebrating that Rodri was going off. And I didn't understand it because in my opinion, I thought in that particular game and maybe all tournament, controversial opinion, I thought Fabian Ruiz was way more impressive for Spain than Rodri. Rodri did what we all know him to do. He's a world-class player. I wasn't surprised by his performance. I wasn't surprised by how much of a linchpin and an important player he is for Spain. Didn't surprise me. I got it. Fabian Ruiz, I didn't know much about. And he absolutely ran the show. Can defend, can attack, like dictate the play. Just big personality, can be a goal threat. He was impressive as hell. But anyway, Rodri goes off, unfortunate injury. Then you get on, then you get this guy coming on, right? This Zubi Mendy guy. And I swear to God, if you look at it without knowing what they look like, on without knowing their names, if there's no names in the jersey, that's just Rodri. Rodri Mark II. That's just another Rodri. He slotted in like it was nothing and just started bopping the ball around. I was like, oh no, we're in trouble. This guy that the whole timeline is getting excited about has gone off. Now that his substitutes come on and they haven't missed a beat, everything just continued as per normal. Nico Williams started to get the ball way more in space on, left, on that left-hand side or our right-hand side and their left-hand side. And then of course, when the final goal comes, I was very disappointed by the goal because I felt like when the goal did come, it was also at a point in time where I felt like the energy levels were dropping hard. The players were almost close to flatlining. They looked so tired. I'm not sure, again, why it was the season before, the run-up of the tournament itself, whether just the, the, they were, did they spend too much energy in the game. There was a complete obvious lack of energy and positional awareness and stuff and pressuring on the ball. And of course, Spain took advantage of it. I personally don't think it was a good thing for us to let, um, what's his name? For us to let um, Danny Olmo be in that space in the in the in the middle of the box, in the middle of the in the middle of the pitch. Sorry, receive the ball uncontested and be able to control it, look up, and then slap a ball the outside of his foot around our defenders. That then goes into um, Oyazabal, who controls it. Then is able to ping the ball out to the left hand, right hand side, left hand side to uh, an oncoming Kukarela who crosses the ball and Yazabal finishes. I thought that whole move, as clinical and training ground as it was, I wasn't impressed because it wasn't done really at that breakneck speed that you know Spain to be on. I personally think if Declan Rice goes to close down Danny Olmo and 
and limits that space in front of him, because he's a right footed number 10, he wouldn't have been able to flick that ball around the corner. He'd have to come back on his right foot again to find another angle. And by then we would have cut the ball out. Then the Declan Rice not pressing him is what I felt led to the whole situation. But regardless, we still could have rescued it. We still could have rescued it if Kyle Walker was occupying his position at the right back. He wasn't. He was dwindling. He was coming in too much. He left that space open. And as he, when he figured out that the space was open, it was too late because Kukurel was already, was already on his bike. He was already motoring. And when he came and he met the ball at the precise time, which again was very difficult to do because Kyle Walker's coming in with all his force because he knows if he doesn't get this ball, this might be a goal. It might be an own goal for a deflection. It might be a goal for a striker. Kyle Walker is trying his best to get there. He just misses it. And Kukurel is able to put a delightful ball, a delightful ball, bang with pace inside the box, so much so with a bit of curve that it evades John Stones, who's maybe a bit languid also, and maybe could have stretched the leg up, but you know, regardless. And of course, Gay as well, who had, I think, a bad game, um, let Oyazabal get in front of him and nick the ball and scored. And by that time, I thought the game was over. There was no chance we were going to win then. It was too late. And again, I thought really upsetting because I thought we could have we could have won if we would have picked our moments better. Um, but I guess it is the nature of the beast. I'm hoping this also means that Southgate leaves and this is the end of that experiment because as much as he's been great for the overall mood of the team, I feel like selection policy, this favoritism thing that he has, or the loyalty for certain players, the formations, the approach to games, the timidness, it reminds me too much of Ayrton Hogg. And I can't support United with Eric Ten Hag and also support my country, England, and have us be managed by the same managers or play the same type of football. It's too much, man. It's not a release. I need a release. I need an outlet to kind of enjoy some good football. And I can't be having two of those managers. No, I can't. So I'd like for him to go. Um, but anyway, we got to the final. We did our best. It wasn't good enough. The unfortunate part is that Spain didn't even play at their best. I don't think so. And they still put us to the sword very easily. They were missing two very very influential young players in Gavri and Pedri. But they have now in two very, very high-level world-class players in Nico Williams and Lamar, and, and sorry, um, Lemin Yamal, who are going to probably be mainstays in their starting lineup for a while. They both offer different things. I love the fact that Nico Williams is maybe more of a direct, conventional winger. Yamal basically could maybe in his later years be seen as a number 10. I think he could play that role really well. His weight of pass and his assist and just in general is so, so, so high level given his age. The kid is only 17 years old, by the way. He just turned 17. Absolutely insane to think that kid's in year 11 or just a guy to go to first year college and he's playing first team football like this at this level. It's fucking crazy. So big up Lamin Yamal. Absolute madness of a player. Really did enjoy it. But we do need to maybe have another conversation about Jude Bellingham and about his style of play and his position in the team and, you know, the big bro nature of him and the Billy Big Bulls nature of him and stuff and how to best use him in a team and is he detrimental to the team? That needs to be a conversation for another day. But again, um, the players did their best. Um, it did. It wasn't. The, it wasn't enough at this point, especially at the final against the best team in the tournament. I think so. Um, definitely deserved to win. If I'm not mistaken, didn't they win all their games all the way to the final? Like, I, I, like you know, Spain. Come on, man. Like they're too good. I wasn't. Uh, I was. I wasn't surprised that we lost, but I was surprised at how we lost, given that the game was there for us to be won. If we would have took the onus after the equaliser and went for it, we could have scummed that game. I swear, we could have scummed it and we could have won the Euros. But it didn't happen. Football's not coming home. Football is not coming home. Moving on from that one, we got some sad, sad, sad news regarding the Jay Slater disappearance. Unfortunately, according to several news outlets, there has been some remains found in the area around where people think Jay Slater may have passed away or may have gone missing, sorry. And people are now basically saying through hushed tones and rumors and stuff online that most likely the body that was found there was Jay Slater because I think they've been able to confirm maybe belongings, maybe DNA or something. But that's basically where we're at the moment. And um, I'm not going to lie, it's really sad. As much as I was entertaining conspiracy theories and getting into the weeds of all that and laughing at the situation part of me generally wanted him to have been abducted somewhere taken somewhere 
left in the house somewhere or be found in the cave somewhere. I really want to be found. And even if it was revealed later on that it was all some ruse to scam money out of people, I would have been found with that. Just as long as he gets back home to his family and friends. That would have been perfectly okay. Um, but as more time went by and as more people spoke and you got the feeling that less and less people actually knew where where he went and what happened to him and considering it's a small island um, full of locals and tourists basically and you'd imagine a lot of tourists probably don't venture out to certain parts of Tenerife so if you're a local and you see somebody they don't usually see you'd probably be very quick to kind of notice it and the fact that nobody had seen any evidence of the guy didn't give me any confidence there was no real evidence of the guy apart from that one woman who owned the Airbnb who said that she drove past her now. Another theory is that he never left the Airbnb alive and maybe they dumped his body somewhere else. Who knows? But I think the lack of sightings of him was the real concerning part. Very, very concerning. I think so probably in the whole thing. So it's extremely sad that he has been, uh, for now, allegedly found, um, you know, uh, passed away somewhere on the side of the mountain, somewhere in Tenerife. But, if you do watch some of these videos that they posted online about what the terrain looks like, it does make you kind of understand why they were finding it so, so difficult to locate the kid in the first place. Because the terrain out there, is it in Masca or Masca in Tenerife, is absolutely wild. This is where they were searching. So, and I think I remember someone saying, I think it was on a YouTube video, someone actually said like, the terrain in Tenerife is a bit deceptive online or via a video it doesn't look that bad but when you go there it's very mount it's very rocky there's loads of cliffs do you know what i mean it's very hard to navigate but it's also a place where a lot of people that do hiking like to go to but if if you are trying to search for somebody it's not that easy and i remember i think somebody actually said like if if you lost a phone and it was only 100 meters from you you'd have a hard time finding it because of all the little crevices and rocks and stuff and all these little things everywhere so it's not the easiest place to find but i think in recent times if i'm not mistaken they did employ i think the the family did hire someone or some sort of search team with drones or something or a very dedicated and knowledgeable search team that are able to kind of quickly surmise where he might have went and obviously now most likely located the body but this is an example courtesy of this video of a guy that's traversing up and down kind of the the, the landscape that is tenerife to show you what it kind of looks like and how rocky it is and how hard it is to get around Look at that, you can't see on the other side of those bushes. You literally can't see on the other side. It's so dense. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so it was unlikely they were ever going to find him alive after so many days went by. But you never know in these situations. You honestly, 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 never, never, never know. But let's read the report itself that kind of breaks down what happened, courtesy of Sky News. Days later, rescue workers searching for missing teen find human remains, courtesy of Sky News. Rescue workers searching for missing teenager, British teenager Jay Slater in the Tenerife have found the body and are trying to identify it, Spanish police have told Sky News. Evidence strongly suggests the remains are those of 19-year-old um, officers have said. The body does not look to, the body does look to be that of Jay Slater, said LBT Global, a British overseas missing persons charity which has been working with the Slater family. Bloody hell, bro. It said in a statement, it understood that the body was found close to the site of Jay Slater's mobile phone last location. Wow. So they must have been searching, think about that. They must have been searching that area anyway, where that last ping from his phone came from, and they couldn't find it within the time that he went missing. That just shows you how hard it is to navigate that area. They couldn't find it within that radius they were in, 500 meters, whatever it may be. They couldn't find him until many days had passed. Damn, man. Although the formal identification is yet to be carried out, the body was found with Mrs. Slater's possessions and clothes. A post-mortem forensic inquiries will follow. The police said in a statement that the Civil Guards Mountain Rescue Group had located a lifeless body of a young man in the Masca area after 29 days of constant searching. 
They said, given the complexity of the case, the discovery has been possible thanks to the insistence and the discreet search carried out by the civil guard during these 29 days. Parts of the countryside were preserved so they were not filled with curious onlookers. Oh, so it's going to be easier to kind of gather evidence, I'm assuming, because not a lot of people pass around there. For officers went on, um, all indications indicate that it could be the young British man who's been missing since June 17th in the absence of full identification. The first investigation revealed that he could have suffered an accident for an inaccessible area where he was found. We are awaiting the results of the autopsy. Um, police commentator Graham w Graham Whitton said the geography of the area where Slater went missing made the search harder. Clearly, the terrain is exceptionally difficult to navigate, but especially search thoroughly and properly with the resources, the equipment and the tactics that they were using. Mr. Slater was last heard from after setting off to walk from an old northern area of the island back to his holiday accommodation in the south, a journey of about 11 hours. He flew out of the Spanish island with friends on the 13th of June to attend a music festival at Papigayo nightclub in the southern resort of, pa of Playa de la Americas. At 8.30am on the 17th of June, he called his friend Lucy, telling her that he'd missed the bus and the phone battery was at 1% and he had to cut an on his leg on a cactus. On Sunday, his mother Debbie Duncan said the family cannot put into words the heartache they've been through. She said that her son is loved by everyone and is close bond with his family and many, many friends. Miss Duncan described her boy as loving son, brother, grandson, nephew, cousin and friend to many. She also said that the certain comments online were distressing for all of us to read. Miss Duncan said that we are aware of awful comments and conspiracy theories that are filling social media. These theories are hindering the people who are trying to help in the investigation and here in Tenerife and the vile it's vile that we see that as a family so of course it's incredibly sad that he passed um especially if they confirm that is him and that is the body and it is terrible that the conspiracy theories did maybe add distress to the family but considering how much was hidden and considering how dodgy it seemed from the beginning i can kind of understand why some people went overboard with the conspiracy theories me personally i still wanted the kid to be found i didn't care if it did come out that the gofundme was a scam didn't care if it did come out the kid was a drug mule didn't give a crap just find the kid just find the kid just find him but it being a point where they find him and he's passed is so tragic so 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 tragic and i can't imagine what their family is going through because in some cases some people would say it is somewhat of a blessing that they found him so that they can mourn him they can bury him and mourn him properly because you can only imagine what madeline mccann's family are going for if going through if you believe what they went through is what they went through you can only believe what they're going through right in terms of the ch missing child and you don't know if the child is dead if the child is alive that sort of like pain and heartache and lack of closure is probably very difficult to deal with so maybe the closure is a good thing but you know you still want your you don't want no one wants their child especially a teenager who's going to a fairly bog standard lads holiday mates holiday in tenerife the whole island from what i've led to understand and that's in that particular time of the year is populated by young people especially people between the ages of like 18 and 25 it's not like a crazy place to go to it's not like they're going to some rural area somewhere in the middle of nowhere no they're going to a very densely populated area with many many tourists from all around the world who go on vacation there every single summer they go there they party they have a good time they drink they do loads of drugs and they come back home none of them some of them well the majority of them don't pass away especially not in these circumstances so when this happens to you as a family it's got to be so heartaking you know what i mean you kiss your baby goodbye you know say what wave to them at the flipping gate or stuff and you're eagerly anticipating them coming back and then unfortunately they come back in a body bag i can't imagine I honestly, honestly can't imagine. But it does also, sh honestly, honestly show that sometimes, that's why conspiracy theories can be a little bit annoying because sometimes the, e the easiest explanation is usually the most correct one. And I do remember in the beginning, someone suggested earlier on, I, for I think it was actually in the J Slater Reddit, which has been a little bit of a point of contention because you know there was, there's been some toxic and maybe not, some, not so great threads on there. But I do remember very early on, someone just said like, I don't suspect foul play. Someone just said, look, most likely the kid went off wondering 
as we've all done, especially being a British teenager and maybe being a little bit angsty to get home and maybe being a bit worse for wear, coming down from drugs and drinking and stuff and just went wandering, tried to figure out his way home by himself, ended up going the wrong way, slipped somewhere, got injured, but unfortunately fell down somewhere where he wasn't accessible by people. And because he's in a rural part of Tenerife, many people might not have passed him and he had no access or no, 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 no way to alert people of where he was his phone was on one percent he's in a foreign country he could have easily just tripped fell down somewhere and then unfortunately he didn't pass away that way so much just that very early on and i was thinking you know what now it's been proven right unfortunately so so very very sad to hear thoughts and feelings go out to jay slater and his family i can't imagine i really can't imagine what they're going through like i said like I was lucky enough to go to my friend's first, my first friend's holiday when I was about 18, 19 or so. And I went to New York and that was a fun time, but we still got up to all sorts of madness. But then that was also, you know, a fun time with your friends and stuff. Maybe a bit young to go, but still a good thing to go to as a young boy. And it's very difficult at that age also when you're coming into your adult, you know, young, young adulthood and stuff. It's hard for anybody to tell you what to do. So as a parent, you kind of want to give your kid a little bit of like, you know, leeway, a bit of freedom to do what they want to do and stuff. And you don't expect it to end this way you expect to go away learn some lessons maybe fall in love with the place that they're going to maybe realize it's not for them whatever you hear their stories but you want to hear from them when they get back you don't expect them to come back in a body bag so i can't imagine what they're going through so thoughts and feelings go out to jay slater and his family and close friends and yeah man i hope this is some closure it's obviously going to be heartbreaking especially some of the questions that are going to come after the fact but regardless in this particular moment r.i.p to jay slater r.i.p to jay slater just to break up the misery just to break up the misery just to break up the misery i saw this tweet online and it got me thinking it's really hard it's really hard to be a dude, especially a straight dude, and to look hot nowadays. Because girls nowadays have weave, they have different hairstyles, they have makeup, they have different types of fashions and stuff. They have this uh, overall acceptance of like cosmetic surgery that can, that can honestly take them from looking like a two to genuinely across the board looking like a seven and an eight upwards. You can get the most bog standard, mid, ugly girl put her on a bit of a reg regiment plan, maybe even just jab her with Ozempic a couple of times, make sure you get the makeup on, you get the makeup looking right, makeup that kind of suits their face. If they have some things missing on their face that you want to add, you can add it with some filler and other things, rhinoplasty, all this sort of stuff, jaw, shaving, all this sort of thing people do, right? Good makeup and good clothes to complement their shape. Boom, they've gone from a two to a seven upwards. What a dude, what can you do if you're a guy? What can you do if you're a guy? Get a haircut, cool. Work out, cool. Maybe improve your dress sense, cool. Big watch, cool. Car, cool. But obviously, your phys physicality, your physical doesn't improve that much. Your grill is still your grill. So this particular tweet broke my heart. Broke my heart when I saw it. This particular person on Twitter quote tweeted Sexy Red's post where she's standing with um, the one and only Don Tolliver at Wireless Festival. And she quote to it and said, what does Kali Uchi see in him? <laughs> what does Kali Uchi see in Don Tolliver? And it broke my heart when I saw this because I was like, look, no one's saying Don Tolliver is the cutest guy in the world, right? No one is saying that. But unfortunately for him, he doesn't have much to do. He doesn't have much to go. He can't look like this light-skinned guy in the back here. He doesn't have the face for it. His cranium is just too big. Maybe those braids will actually suit this light-skinned guy at the back here who's, you know, mugging it off of the camera. But when your head is that shape, when you've got that size of a head shape, which I think might be double the size of Sexy Reds, actually. His head shape here might be double the size of Sexy Reds, right? He's got almost got like this long back bottom section, long, long forehead. He's also got a receding hairline. There's not much you can do. Because I know in his head he wants dreads, he wants to look this way, he thinks it looks cute, and unfortunately it just doesn't sit with his overall face. And I'm always actually curious, with his, with his cranium and with it being that big, why wouldn't you want to like close it up a bit and like, you know, sharpen the image of the bottom by growing a beard? But I'm assuming as a boy, he probably has grown a beard, doesn't, look, doesn't like how it looks, and prefers to go you know, without it and go clean shaven. So he's probably gone through that ugly phase of trying to grow a beard and it's all patchy and not really growing right. So he's like, you know what? Fuck that. I'm going to shave it clean shaven. 
But unfortunately, he doesn't have the ability to put on foundation, to give himself cheekbones, to maybe just look and make, to change the proportion of his face or whatever, or just make himself look cuter on the eye. So all he has to do is just be a, you know, a very popular artist, become very rich and famous, and then hope that can kind of segue into ca catching the baddie, which he did. He's got Kali Uchis under his arm. Them, him and Kali Uchis have obviously been a couple for a long time, right? And they're obviously out here enjoying life and living the life of Riley. So that's the only thing a man can have. The only thing a man can have is success. Success might actually help you. That's the only thing that might help to actually improve your looks. Success. That's all. Nothing else can actually improve you because you're not really allowed to do plastic surgery. You're not really allowed to get braids, right? No one's going to let you get braids. No normal person will say it's okay for you to have braids. So all you can do really, all you can do is work out, get in best shape as you can, but still your proportions are going to be your proportions. In a particular picture here, it looks like he might be a little bit shorter than Caliucci's. I'm not really too sure. But there's not much you can do when your grill is your grill. You know, you, you don't have much to work with. That's all you have. So it's unfair when I see these tweets from ladies saying, what does Kaliuchi see in him? Because it's like, in my opinion, again, not to be mean to the lady, but Kaliuchi is, you know, she's cute, but I don't think she's that far out of his league. And also, there's something about Kaliuchi's and Dom Tolliver. I think they kind of look alike. There's something about their faces that almost looks alike. I think if you strip away the makeup, I think they kind of look alike. I'm not going to lie. They kind of have the same sort of like symmetry. Maybe it's because everything's bunched up in the middle of their faces. I don't know. There's something about them facial wise that makes me think they look alike. So I'm not really, you know, I'm not really that perturbed or like out, you know, um, I'm not really that shocked to see that they're both together because I think they both suit. I'm not going to lie. I think they actually look cute together in a weird way. They actually look really, really cute together. But I think it's just unfair that guys... Are, tried, are kind of held to the same beauty standards as women when the majority of women out there aren't models. They're just girls who are able to, you know, put on makeup and improve their base level that they have. Because a, a girl doesn't really get judged on her base level, really and truly, which is weird because Kali, sorry, um, Sexy Red is, a, is one of the ones that you should be judging on her base level because her base level is, she's a cutie. If you've seen um, Sexy Red without makeup, you're like, wow. Sexy Red without makeup, without the red weave, she actually looks really pretty. And actually in this picture, actually, um, in this actual picture, you actually see she's got very clear skin here. The complexion is banging. She's probably one of those people, like, when you see her in real life, she probably stuns you a lot more. But there's a lot of girls out there who, without a full face of makeup, it's trouble for them out there. It's struggle city. But again, they have that ability. So God bless to them. But that's just a guy. There's not really much you can do. And I've honestly seen it. Once I've been doing my facials. And now I've been doing my facials. I, I, you know, I'm not going to say I'm as ugly as fucking Dom Tolliver. But now that I'm doing my facials, I've seen... Pause, by the way. Facial. I said facials about twice there. Pause. But now that I'm getting my facials, pause. Um, I've kind of come to the realization of why people are so eager to get plastic surgery. Because getting all that stuff done, doing it every day, like doing the flipping, what I do now, I do the cleanser, I do the toner, I do the, um, I do the mucus thing, pores, I do the vitamin C, I do the oils, I do the moisturizers, the sunscreens, it's all too much bro, every day, then you have a nighttime regime, then maybe you have a regime for when you go on holiday, it's just, oh god, it's exhausting, so I completely, completely understand why some people decide, you know what, fuck this, man. Just put me under the knife. Just break this, crack that, realign this, saw that down, fill this up, buccal fat this, and then let me come out and, and at least have the base level good at where it needs to be. Because some people are blessed, as this guy here in the pink. You know, you just got a face. It is what it is. Nine times out of ten, most girls will think you're cute. And some people like Don Tolliver, you have to be a world touring, successful R&B hip-hop artist. And then suddenly, oh shit, you're really cute now. You know, you're really cute. It's like that famous future quote. You're everyone's type when you're rich or something like that. Something along those lines. You're always going to be her type or you're everyone's type as long as you got money. And that is the that is the name of the game, actually. If a guy can improve his riz, if a guy can improve his game, he's out of here. That's all it takes. But that also isn't the easiest thing to do. So um, solidarity to all my ugly niggas out there. Solidarity to all my ugly niggas out there. Talking about solidarity... Yo, the Trump shooting. <laughs> How mad was that? 
I was in a weird position because I was streaming all day when it happened. So I popped out to go get some din dins. And when I was walking back, I was listening to music. I was having a good time, chilling, being on my phone and stuff, but mostly listening to music. I was just stuck in the Apple Music app. So I was sitting, walking back home. For the most part, when I do order some food, I don't like to, if I'm going to get takeout, I don't like to get takeout. If I do get takeout, I kind of quote unquote punish myself by going to the shop to buy it. I don't like to order it from the app because that's just, you know, exorbitant prices. And also, I feel like if you're going to eat horrible food, the least you can do is go pick it up yourself, right? So I go and walk there, buy it, and whatever. As I was coming back, it felt kind of nice out. I was feeling myself, good day of streaming. I sat down on the bench, and I decided to eat the food, listen to the music, watch, put people watching, had my flipping noise cancer headphones on, loving life. But I hadn't checked the news. So when I came back home, about to do my other stream, I just opened my phone, I checked, and I was like, oh, shit. Mama mia, Don't Trump's been shot. And I was trying to figure out, is he dead? Is he all right? Is he dead? Is he good? And then, of course, along the line, I figured out and the news slowly came through that he was perfectly okay and just had um, the bullet graze his ear, luckily. But wow, bro. Wow, wow, wow. I would have never predicted this. I swear to God. People are saying they would have predicted it. I think are full of crap because I would have predicted this during his first term. The country was so divided or the, it seemed so divided. Protests were so volatile everything was so highly charged and trump was also i think a little bit more divisive back then. i think nowadays he's kind of boring if that is the right thing to say he's not as like blockbuster and bombastic and rah, rah, as he was before i think he's a little bit more sullen a little bit more you know chill even a debate against biden i think the trump of old would have really ripped into him he was kind of cash and maybe it's a good tactic you kind of want to just let biden talk and he's going to like talk himself out of getting elected again but this version of Trump, I don't think, should elicit that type of response. Maybe the previous version of Trump that was during his first term, that, that I wouldn't be surprised of if it happened. But it did happen. But the circumstances around how it happened, the circumstances about how it happened, bro, are insane. Insane. Especially, especially the stuff concerning the Secret Service. The Secret Service that were meant to, you know, put their lives on the line to flip and help Trump and to protect him, sorry, to keep him alive. A lot of those guys have to be complicit in this. This has to be some sort of like deep state attack or something, I swear. Because there was a video that I watched during the stream that I thought was a bit of a plan and didn't seem real, seemed like a skit or a bit, where they interviewed this ginger guy who was saying that he was barbecuing around the area where Donald Trump was giving that um, speech. And him and his friends that were barbecuing and drinking beer and eating and overhearing the speech and having a good time, they saw the sniper climb up on the roof of a building next to where Trump was giving a speech. And they were pointing and shouting at the, at the guy and telling the police, look, there's a guy there with a gun. And then if you look at the building where the guy crewed up on, it's a white building. It's a white farmhouse type of thing. And the guy's in full camo. No, I think he's wearing a t-shirt and camo pants. and He's got long hair. So he sticks out against that. He might as well be wearing all red, but you can see him. It's not like he blends in and he's wearing all white. No, he's wearing camo. Camo pants and a, and a kind of like a grey, whatever, green shirt or something. And long hair. You can see him there clearly. And, and, the, and the farm building thing itself wasn't even that high. It was almost like a thing where if you're tall enough, you can see the top of the roof from a certain angle, certain distance. And they were pointing at him like, hey, the guy's there, the guy's there. Allegedly, the police didn't react quick enough. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking there was some sort of stand down order because if you watch movies, movies shouldn't be what you reference in these type of situations, but I swear it, watch any sniper movie, watch any thriller, political thriller that involves assassinations. What's the one thing that they talk about a lot? They talk about how often they have like snipers on buildings around the perimeter of where the president is talking or where the politician is giving a speech. And usually in movies, right, they have to do so much to get that shot off. Sometimes in movies, they'll have like decoys. They might have a car that drives into a, a, a bank nearby, blows up, all the police rush there, and then the sniper takes a chance where, where there's not much kind of attention on that area and then t t uh, takes a shot. In this one, the guy climbed up a farmhouse that was painted white, wearing camo, and was able to get a shot off. 
of several. I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, they got off five. I think they said five. It could have been three, but I think they said five. Are you insane before they got neutral, before they got capped, before they got their snot box rocks, as fucking Hassan Campbell would say? Do you know how insane that is, that he was able to do that? Absolutely, in my opinion, wild, which makes you believe there was some sort of stand down order. I don't think everybody was complicit, the secret service, the snap. No, most likely somebody who's above all of our pay grades was able to put that call in and say, don't respond, don't shoot, don't shoot. Because there's one other camera angle where you see the sniper seeing the guy. There's a camera angle where the sniper sees the, the, the assailant, the sniper, and he doesn't hit a shot. He waits for him to make the shot first. And you're like, oh my God. But at that level of service, you are basically a subordinate. Wherever they say goes, they, they say stand down. You have to stand down. You can't do anything. If not, you might even risk going to prison. You might even risk dying yourself. So the sniper is there on the roof. He's pointing. He's like trying to, he's like pointing. And you can see it. And then at, when the shots got, when the, when the sniper shoots, that's when suddenly the sniper goes for the shot. But it's like, wow, bro, they had a drop on him. They saw him early. They could have took him out and they didn't. And if I'm not mistaken, the distance also was only, the distance also was only, 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 only 100 meters or so. And I say that because if you run, you know 100 meters isn't that far. And I'd imagine if you're a marksman, if you're good with your guns, hitting somebody from 100 meters away, with almost a plain line of sight, yes, the wind factors in it, yes, the bullet weight, I know. But if you're a marksman, if you know how to shoot, you could probably hit that 10 times out of 10. The, he's a big dude also. It's a big target. Plain clear of sight. You could have easily hit him without hitting anybody else and unfortunately hitting an a, a innocent bystander that was just watching it, RIP to the guy that passed away. You could easily hit him once with one bullet and be out. It wouldn't be that difficult. 100 meters isn't that far and still he's able to get those shots off. It just shows the complete ineptitude of the Secret Service, um, and obviously maybe it shows that there's somebody high above that's saying, hey, we need to get this guy off. But unfortunately, again, if, the, if that was the case, and they're really worried about Trump being president, they've all but, they've all but certain, they've all but certain confirmed this guy's going to be the next president of the United States. Because the way that he reacted in that situation in the midst of it, which is kind of funny because there's a bit where he all the Secret Service pile on top of him and he's worried about his shoes. Where's my shoes? Where's my shoes? Because uh, like, like all of these events, I don't know why, an event that happens where you get like hit or something, because I've watched a lot of public freakout videos and I love watching videos of people falling over and falling out of buildings, getting hit by cars and stuff, right? For whatever reason, the first thing that flies off is the shoes. So whenever he kept saying, get with my shoes, with my shoes, it made me think, oh shit, they cut this guy out of his shoes. He somehow is whatever, going through what he's going through, adrenaline running super high, and he still manages though, when they secure him, and he's realized he's safe on his secret service guys, he figures out a way to get his fist and punch it up in the air, while half of his face is covered with blood and his ear is leaking. Do you know how metal, do you know how hardcore, do you know how badass that is? Like him or not, politics aside, the fact that you nearly got your head completely taken off from your shoulders. That would have probably left a hole in the side of his face if it went through what it was meant to go through. And you just, in the midst of it all, they can't defeat me. I'm bulletproof. I'm Teflon done. You know, you put on flipping um, 100 shots and shit. You know, RIP Young Dolph. God damn it, bro. What an absolute consummate, consummate stage man. What a consummate professional. What a consumer entertainer. That's probably all those years of celebrity life and being on the front line and being on TV and marketing and stuff that led him believe like, no, 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 we need to make something of this. I need to guarantee that those polls are landing in my favor because maybe before this, even though people think he was going to win because Biden is looking a bit see now and, the, you know, and the economy in the country isn't in a good place. Maybe they thought people were going to vote for Trump in order to kind of feel like they're going to get out of this situation with him, which is probably not true. No one candidate is going to save you, to be completely honest, really and truly. But maybe there was an understanding with the Republicans or with him, actually. I'm actually down in the polls. People feel I'm going to win, but this Biden guy is actually just going to stutter and stumble over the finishing line. So maybe that was playing in the back of his head. Like, oh shit, I need to guarantee that I kind of swing the votes in my favour. And boom, he did. And now this is what the conversation is all about. 
and no one's escaping it. And it's absolutely wild, wild to see it all play out in real time. But the ineptitude of the Secret Service is like, wow, bro. Because let's imagine that person from up above doesn't exist. Let's just imagine they're just slow to react. Maybe they were worried if they took the first shot and the kid was just taking pictures, they'd look like murderers or something. But it's like, bro, in movies, they would, like, in movies, in that situation, if you don't announce why you're there or something or you don't make it clear that you're doing something innocent, you get shot. They don't ask no questions. They'd rather ask for forgiveness later. They'd rather ask for forgiveness later. But in this situation, they're dilly-dallying. So it makes me believe that there was some sort of stand-down order because I swear that sniper had the fucking drop on him. He saw him. He saw him. They both did. You see them kind of talking. It's like, it's almost like they're getting told to like, no, don't shoot. Okay. And then he shoots and then bang, they go for it. And of course they take him out instantly because it's not a hard shot to make. It's flipping wild. Wild how it happened. Honestly, absolutely wild. The police there, probably somebody there should get fired, especially the local police, if they didn't react to it how they should have. Because allegedly there was a police on the ground next to the guy that was on the barbecue who saw what happened and they didn't react. And they kind of just like were walking around and not really paying attention. Maybe they were involved in it. I'm not really too sure. But wow, man. Absolutely wow. Wow, wow. So the other situation that's really sad about it though, honestly, the other situation that's really, really sad about it, honestly, is the victim that passed away in a crowd. RIP to that guy, man. An innocent victim passed away. Allegedly, he was trying to protect his family. He was covering them with his body. I think somebody said there's a video of him getting shot in the head. I heard somebody say that he was actually covering them with his body. So I'm not too sure if the shot came and hit him in the head while he's covering his, his family. I'm not sure what the case is, but regardless, that guy is a hero. Um, there are some dicey tweets that have come out about him. I'm not going to lie on social, but it doesn't really matter he's in that situation you're an absolute hero for diving over your family and protecting them and basically giving your life to protect them absolutely wow so this is Kershaw of the bbc it says who are the trump rally shooting victims it goes here an attempt to assassinate president trump um former president trump at a rally in pennsylvania has left one bystander dead and two seriously injured so get well soon to one seriously injured trump suffered an upper ear injury but was otherwise unharmed later telling reporters that if he had moved his head slightly he could have been hit by the head and three other men who were attending the rally on the 30th of july were also not lucky i love that in the statement he said like he only turned his head to read the stats and stuff about immigration or about illegal immigrants on the screen <laughs> so in a weird way illegal immigration was the reason why he lived and also partly the reason why he maybe couldn't have lived you know what i mean F fucking hilarious so allegedly because he turned his head slightly that bullet missed because if he would have been his head like that it would have went straight through the back of his head but then it went it grazed his ear wild 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 things so allegedly uh cory Comprator, Comprator, the 50 year old volunteer um, chief died while trying to protect his family during the attempted assassination, driving into, diving onto them to shield them from the bullets. God damn it. Let's hear from his friend here. He's a great man that deserves honor and respect in the highest of high. Uh, uh, he wouldn't want us to sit here and be sad. He, he would hate it from what I've gotten knowing him and just hearing other people talk, it's, it's the last thing he'd want. He'd, he'd want to share the good times and think of them. But he wouldn't want to be thought of as a hero, but it's, that's definitely how he should be remembered. He, he just is one of those guys, we don't do it for the thanks or the pat on the back, nothing like that. We do it because we love it and we have a passion for it. And that's, that's what he did saving his family was because of just the love and the passion he had. Corey died a hero. Um, continuing on, David Dutch. My, Mr. Dutch is from Pennsylvania City in New Kensington and is a long-time employee of technology company Siemens, according to his sister, Jennifer Very Grazi, told the New York Times that the 57-year-old suffered damage to his liver, broken ribs in the shooting, and has had to have more than one operation. She described him as a long-time Trump supporter. Let's play the video. My friend's mom came downstairs and s said, do you know who this is? They ser they're saying it's a 20-year-old from Bethel Park. His name's Thomas Crooks. And I just... Okay, in, this, in the, this video, this woman talking about the actual shooter. This isn't about David Dutch, the victim. This is someone talking about the actual shooter that was killed. ...was so shocked 
because this was someone I had been in history class with. I had been in classes with, we had graduated with him, and it was just something I would have never seen coming. He was always getting good grades on tests, everything like that. He was very passionate about history, but it was nothing out of the ordinary. He was a nice kid, and I had never had an experience with him where I was like, he, you know, isn't nice. He was always nice, and I was always friendly to him. He did sit alone at lunch, like he was, he was always alone. I mean, he was bullied every day, every day. Like you could look at him and you would be like, something's a little off. That's that's how I could describe it. How you feel knowing that he's on the street? Yeah. Probably how anybody else would feel. You know, as far as I trusted, I trust the neighborhood. I trust the people. There's never been anything happening. The David Dutch um, is from Pennsylvania, city of New Kensington, as a longtime employer of technology company Siemens. Jennifer Vrazigari told the New York Times the 57 year old suffered damage from his liver, broken ribs, and shooting um, from the shooting, sorry, and has had more than one operation. He was ex exercising his rights and went to the rally, and we didn't deserve to, he didn't deserve any of this. The Pennsylvania branch of the Marine Corps League, a veteran association, identified Mr. Dutch as one of the members. James, James Coppenhaver. James Coppenhaver, 74, is from Moon Township, Pennsylvania, and was registered Democrat, the New York Times reports. Albert Quay, a supervisor of the Moon Township, told the New York Times that the, Mr. Copenhaver has retired and become very interested in local politics. Mr. Copenhaver is this is a member of Moon Tower Township banner. So yeah, good, um, what do you call it? Get well soon to James Coppenhaver, and also get well soon to David Dutch, and RIP to the victim, Corey Crepator, because he did not, he does not deserve that, man. He did not deserve that. So RIP to that guy, absolutely tragic that he passed away that way, but he did pass away an absolute flipping hero. So RIP to Corey Cop, um, Copperator, and I hope his family have some semblance of peace going forward. I really, really do. And we also need to talk about this. This is an incredible, incredible, incredible video for me to basically share with you guys here. So as some of you guys know, a couple of weeks ago, this prison officer was unfortunately, unfortunately exposed for having sex with the prison inmate. It was a very explicit video that a lot of people were sharing around social media. I was commenting on it. I was watching it several times because although it was very, 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 very bad what they did, it was also an incredibly hot video. So a lot of people were sharing it and enjoying it um, for what it was. But unfortunately that video obviously got out we watched it which obviously is not a good thing and the uh, prison officer themselves is now in a lot of trouble a lot a lot a lot of trouble and now this particular prison officer former prison officer i guess has come out to try to correct the narrative that's been going on outside and it's funny because when i watched the video there wasn't much of a narrative to kind of take away from it apart from it's a prison officer obviously doing something that she shouldn't have done but clearly indulging um you know in her lust and enjoying the situation that she was in clearly based on the video you can't say she was doing it under duress or anything so they, i don't feel like there was any narrative to be kind of corrected if anything i was almost surprised that she was acting very ashamed about it but it also made me realize oh that's the difference between the uk and america we don't really have that kind of like for lack of a better term hoary slutty x-rated lacking in morals and dignity and just any kind of semblance of shame attitude that america has which is probably why they create and produce and manufacture so many celebrities in different types of facets in all different types of lane because they have no self oh that was self, they have no like shame they have no level of embarrassment they don't really like they, yeah like even cool people actually i think tim dylan made a point of that even cool people in america have done one thing in their lives especially online that you could deem to be corny they could deem to be lame they could deem to be a bit like uh beneath that person but they're all willing and able to do that that's why they probably secure the bag and that's why they probably have a thriving thriving celebrity industry both from people that are actually celebrities and the viewers themselves who watch it and the publications it's all this all it's a big machine but i think in the uk we're probably a little bit more puritanical maybe it's a catholicism base i'm not too sure what it is but that idea of being that openly like sexual and op yeah, openly sexual lacking principles and morals and whatever it may be doesn't work the only place i can think of who did that last 
at a really big level and was really unapologetic about it was probably Jordan. And whenever Jordan does appear on any blog, especially online, the comments are always negative. But she's the only person that's been consistently, yeah, I, I, I am who I am. I am Katie Price. I am Jordan. It is what it is. She's very unapologetic and very steadfast in that. But I think the UK, you're kind of steered to be a certain type of celebrity but you can't be that american celebrity that's very you know out there with it I, like for instance i don't think we would ever produce a kim kardashian i don't think our industry our public would ever let a kim kardashian get to the level of celebrity that she got to i think she could only get to that celebrity in america where you start off being known as like a socialite then you have that sex video with ray j and then you turn into whoever you turn into now i don't think that could ever happen in the uk so with all that being said that made me think, oh, Ra, man, this girl's not going to be able to enjoy this moment. Because I feel like if she did that in a US prison, she would have like a TV show by now confirmed, maybe on Zeus, who cares, but she'll still have one. She'll be on all the big popular podcasts, getting appearance money. She'd be doing walkthrough at clubs. Like she'd be having sponsors on her Instagram. Like things would be going up for her. Yes, there'll be people writing op-eds and being complaining about her lifestyle and blah, 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 blah. But I think if she was in America, she could profit immensely from this. But unfortunately, she's from here. Um, even though I think she's got uh, Portuguese ancestry, she's from here. And we just, it doesn't run that that here anymore. So now that she's in trouble with the courts, she's lost her job and shit. It's not looking good for her because I've not also seen on other podcasts. Maybe she's avoiding going on the podcast now because there's an active um, court case on her and she probably can't talk about the situation. But I think if she was in America, she could definitely profit off this way more than she can in the UK. So she came out, broke her silence. And it's a funny video, I feel like, because there's not much to explain. It's a video of where you're in prison, bouncing on a prisoner's dick, having a good time, and the other prisoner's recording you. There's not much to explain here, really and truly. It's unfortunate that you got caught because you, it's not like you didn't mean to do it. You did it because you like to do it and you wanted to do it and you're happy to do it. It's just unfortunate you got caught. But there's no narrative to rewrite or to correct, really. But in England, you kind of have to always, like, you know, cop pleas and beg for forgiveness and explain yourself and all this sort of stuff, which is a nonsense, really. Grown adults consenting in grown adult things. Obviously inappropriate in a situation, but it's unfortunate that her whole life has come tumbling down and the only avenue out she probably has is moving to another country or just doubling down on the OnlyFans, unfortunately. Hello once again, Instagram. I hope you can appreciate this. this is going to be a very awkward and uncomfortable conversation for me to have. I just thought I really needed to come on here and clarify a lot of things. <laughs> number one, she's got her number. She's got her best English accent on, isn't it? Her best because we all have this in us. We all have this ability to speak like this. All of us from here, all of us. But I want to know when she do the mandem, what does she sound like? When this girl's with the man them, what does she sound like? When she's with the fellas, does she sound like this? When she's, a, when she's with the other babes out in the club, does she sound like this? Come on, man. She got her best good girl face. On. That's a job interview voice. That's your job interview voice when you go to Liverpool Street for a job interview. You put on your best fucking outfit to have an interview with someone in the Starbucks and explain why you are qualified to have that fucking 28K a year job. That's what that is. Big up this girl. First thing being, there has been a lot, and I mean a lot, a tremendous amount of <laughs> fake profiles of me that have been monetizing off of my disfortune. And Why don't you jump on it then, brother? Do you know how boring this country is? This country is so boring, they banned fucking balloons. They banned scooters at one point. When I was in school, they banned yo-yos. They banned Beyblades. They banned everything. This country is anti-fun. If you know that's the case, we don't even have clubs that are open past 2 a.m. Most clubs in London close before 1 a.m. We have an entire strip in Liverpool Street all the way until flipping Stoke Newton where there's no club open after 4. I think we may be the exception of Vogue Fabrics. I think. I don't know anymore because I don't really go there anymore. But there's no clubs open. No fun times to be had unless you want to go and have a fun time in Box Park. If you like raving in Box Park, you might as well rave in Westfield, in my personal opinion. We're anti-fun. If that's the case, babes, open your own Instagram. Monetize on that thing yourself. Jump on TikTok. Get all those fucking, mmm, bananas so good, mmm. 
do all that sort of shit. Enjoy yourself, man. Capitalize on the money. Because, God forbid, this might be your only time of freedom. This might girl might, this girl, touch wood, she doesn't. But this girl might legit end up in prison. So the time that you're out, let's just cash it in. Let's get, let's get some appearances on some podcast. And again, honey dick them as well. Let, agree to go on there. Then when you get on there, say, I can't talk about this. It's an active, it's an active ongoing court case. I can't talk about this. It's an act. Like, whatever. It doesn't matter. At least you're on there. You cash in the money. Jump on TikTok. Cash in the money. Jump on stream. Cash in the money. Come on, bro. This country is boring. You can't wait for people to, like, she should have been on there already. She should have put her profile up and should have immediately gone to Instagram and got it verified. Because now you're in the news, you can get your profile verified because they want to make sure that a notable person in the news, you can spot which profile is the legit one. And even though now on Instagram, you can pay for ticks. I think if you click the tick, it tells you if the person paid for it, kind of, or if they're a legit celebrity known person in the news. That's what you should have done. You shouldn't have waited. You dilly-dallied too long, bro. Dilly-dallied. Um, the scandal that the entire world has somehow managed to be involved in. <laughs> this was you went you went on a date, bro. You didn't go to a fucking easy hotel with your fella and had a bit of a bunk session and somebody recorded a little audio of you through your door or something. You're in the prison cell with another prisoner. That guy's that guy's a real op, by the way. If I if I ever share a picture of that Asian dude smoking a blunt and I share it to you, no, I'm on some hating thing. If I send you a screenshot of that guy's face smiling, smoking a joint, no, I'm on a hating vibe. No, that I'm on hating time, because that guy is such a hater that he wasn't getting the cheeks that he leaked it. That's my theory, anyway. My theory is that he tried to smash. She said no. He was like, what? got pissed off and leaked it because you're trying to, you're trying to probably blackmail her and her being a dummy was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. You're going to, you're going to, you can, you can put it out there, which is a dumb move. I think so, because you know, just give me a little tug and it, it would have kept it quiet and you kept your job and you can still go and do your thing if you need to. But she found him so, so repulsive. She was willing to risk her job and her freedom. <laughs> I have not monetized one fucking bit at all this is my only social media platform and i only just activated it again you should have babe this isn't noble you're not noble you're not a principled person no one's looking at you for that we saw you jumping up and down some cell selly's dick in prison bareback full 1080p there is no going back you're not a that, that i'm sorry that is gone now it's unfortunate it might be the only time you've ever done that in your life but this is the nature of the game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Unfortunately, unfortunately, you literally, you legit could have lost your virginity there and everyone would have still looked at you as a whore. Unfortunately so. That's, it is what it is. Take it, monetize it. Because you've only got a short window. It's a short window. In the UK, it's worse because we don't really have, I wouldn't say healthy in separate culture, but people here are kind of hatery. So look at Hoktua girl. I don't think Hoktua girl lasts long in the UK. There's going to be op-eds about her being, ah, I love a white person, ah, complaining about that sort of shit. People won't be happy about that. Even in America, they're doing that. But it wouldn't last here. So you have to be quick to jump on it. She wasn't quick enough. She dilly-dallied. People monetize. I, I, could, I think because at one time, I was actually searching for this video and I was searching her name on Instagram and I actually did see profiles that had like cash apps in their URL, PayPal links. That's your fault. You should have done that before, bro. You should have had your cash up there. HMP, HMP, HMP Baddy. HMP Bay. You should have had your profile already set up. You didn't. And now you're paying the ultimate price. So... If you do come across fake profiles of me asking for money, please don't fall for it. There's been a lot of GoFundMes and fake OnlyFans accounts that are not me. And I do apologise. By the way, she does have an OnlyFans account. It did get leaked and the videos are X-rated! X-rated! So it's not like she's just a one-off thing. It's not a one-off thing. She obviously enjoys what she's doing. Fair. She might have a relationship, but that's allowed. Fair. Whatever. Just that this is not necessary. You don't need to cop please like this. You don't need to try to explain yourself and paint up a narrative. We know what it is. You just should have capitalized it when you could have capitalized on it. Because the evidence is out there. Like, look, come on, come on. You're not fooling anybody, my darling. 
if you have fallen for it I honestly but from the bottom of my heart I apologize but I really want to clarify that this is my only social media account and I just came back on on the topic of impersonation I thought it very important for me to address this very it's a filter but she's a cute girl isn't it it's a filter but she's a cute girl she actually looks way cuter here than she does in the pictures that we've seen online those like model photo shoot pictures she's got online but hopefully in the future, this leads to a love island. This leads to something. Something. Because professionally, her career is done. Her career is done, done, isn't it? Professionally. She might not even be able to get front of house jobs. Distasteful subject of OnlyFans creators impersonating and pretending to be me and recreating the scenario of said scandal, which I am involved in. Very, very distasteful for you to monetize or... <laughs> kidding bro what's this taste for you bear back in some prisoner four weeks into his prison stint and having it all recorded on a nokia 3210 or people re-recording come on man advertise yourselves as me for of content it doesn't fear my trial but furthermore it is incredibly incredibly distasteful it doesn't fear my trial babes maybe don't have sex with prisoners on camera. I'm not even saying don't do it because clearly it happens. It's going to happen. I was surprised in my opinion. I was kind of surprised when I saw her and I was like, oh, you work in a prison. I don't know. I, I, obviously, you can't discriminate people based on their looks. But I'd imagine if you've got a prison full of very young men from a particular walk of life, from a particular background, you would imagine putting a woman like that in there is almost like, you know, hovering a piece of meat on top of a fucking piranha pool. You know what I mean? It's You're playing with fire. But again, you can't discriminate. Just because she looks like a baddie, you can't say she can't get a job. She gets the job. Cool. She's in there with her fucking tailored trousers, hiked up her asshole, bum probably poking, tits po And you can imagine if you're in prison, it's almost like work. When you're at work, you get like work goggles. The girl that is at work that's got like a slight arch, she, she looks like she's got a dumper on her. She looks like Doja Cat or fucking Megan Thee Stallion to you because you're at work and you see her so often and you start to fucking, you know, exaggerate features and start to be all Google-eyed at people. Could you imagine what it's like in prison? It's probably 10 times worse. There's not that many girls. You don't have much access to people and you see her walking up and down and in and around and helping stuff and bending and grabbing stuff. You're like, ah, ah, ah. do you know what I mean? So maybe that was where the issue started in the first place. And I have heard there's issues around staffing with the Tories and the prisons and stuff. And they're having to hire more people that they probably wouldn't have hired and lowering maybe the criteria. I don't know. But surely, surely the mistake is just don't do it on camera. If you're going to do that scummy stuff, because I'm sure it happens, maybe slip some things in, you bring some things in, take some things out, cool. Just don't do it on camera. Please, if you are an OF creator, refrain from tagging said prison. <laughs> we all know the we all know the name of the prison. Please refrain <laughs> from tagging HMP Wandsworth on stupid videos. <laughs> there are other jails in the world. You don't have to pretend to be me. It's very distasteful. Thank you. And lastly, I wanted to tell you all that you do not know my side of the story. <laughs> What side is it? It doesn't fucking matter, really, does it? It doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't matter. It didn't look like you were under duress. It didn't look like you were kidnapped. It didn't look like you get f you were frightened, like you were threatened. Nothing. It looked like you were having a good time, having some quote unquote public sex, and it went awry because the video went out. It's happened. It's unfortunate. But there is no other side of the story. There is, I'm not sorry. There is no other side. There isn't. If anything, if you're being a bit compassionate, which I'm not going to extend that compassion, but if you were, you would maybe be compassionate to the other guy that's involved. His missus is heavily pregnant. And allegedly, because of all the news that happened, she went into some sort of like labor or something happened with the baby. Hopefully it's okay now. But I'm not going to have too much sympathy for that lady because you also are with the guy who's in prison for like house robberies and shit. Allegedly he went to some house and he stole like drills. This is a big man. He's like 30, 30 plus and he's stealing drills and what shot in him at fucking cash converters. Like, I'm sorry. If you're, if you get impregnated by a bozo loser like that, 
whatever happens in life and stuff and problems and him going in and out of jail, that's part of the game you have to live with. So don't, you know what I mean? But if you were going to extend some sympathy, it would be to that young lady because she's technically innocent. But you, come on. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. You put your hand on the stove and you got burnt. It is what it is. You can't be complaining that the manufacturer did, didn't build the stove too high. It was, shouldn't have been high. It should have been higher. The temperature's too hot. No, don't put your hand on the stove. You won't get burnt. The media has a great way of getting a narrative and twisting it for its own benefit. The media love any story to be salacious and sensational. And they what? <laughs> what? I'm all for digging out the media, but the salacious nature of the story is you bouncing up and down that inmate's dick. That's salacious. You giving that guy, cause I, cause I, I didn't even see the full video. I've only seen the two minute version. Allegedly there's a four minute version where she's like going full Glock 3000 on that guy. Like whatever, cool, do what you want to do. But come on bro, just the first two minutes. What's the, that's that's salacious. That video clip was salacious. Not what the media's writing. So what the sun wrote, rumpy, steamy, bonk, whatever, X-ray, whatever. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter what the Daily Mail wrote. The the the, the fucking content, the con the content itself, content itself was salacious, baby. They sensationalize everything. You don't know my side of the story, <laughs> and we'll leave it as that for now. <laughs> What a legend. Actually, no, whilst I'm here. Yeah, go on. And this also has to be addressed. Go on. Whilst I'm here. You don't know who has you. You don't know who your real friends are until shit hits the fan. <laughs> She's so tough. I like her, man. I like her. I like her. I like her, man. I like her. I like her. I like her. I like her, man. This is an insane defense. But I fucking like her, man. I fucking like her. All of my friends who didn't stand by me and protect me while this X-rayed video of me went out, which they probably had no... Imagine, my friends probably had no knowledge that I even had an OF. They probably discovered all of this off the back of me smashing some inmate bareback in front of his other celly, <laughs> right? Oh, blame them for not standing by me. How dare they don't speak up for me and my good name... <laughs> I got myself in this problem, but my friend should have stood up for me. It's their fault, actually. It's the Daily Mail's fault. My friend's fault. It's you. It's the patriarchy. <laughs> what? <laughs> Honest to God, family, friends, you need to pick them very carefully. <laughs> She's funny. I like her. I like her. I like her. I like her. Terry very carefully um <laughs> what about picking the cellmates you're gonna fuck then shouldn't you vet them very carefully maybe pick the one that doesn't have a horny thirsty celly that also wants to get involved maybe pick one that knows how to play their position maybe your decision making process in that as aspect isn't where it needs to be maybe Obviously, everybody knows my mobile phone number was leaked. There has been people going behind my back. Um, the media have literally been following me everywhere. I can't even go into Greg's or Primark without getting papped. It is very... <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Going through what you're going through, the last thing that should be on your mind is a sausage and bean melt. The last thing that should be on your mind is a multi-pack of socks. I'm not going to lie. Do with what you have. Order some stuff online. But the last thing you should be thinking about buying is a vegan sausage roll. I don't know. Maybe. you got other things to worry about. I don't know. That's what I'll be worried about right now. But what do I know? Annoying. Um, a lot of the time, it's people who you thought got, had your back. And they just don't. <laughs> and that's been really heartbreaking. On top of all of this. On top of everything, yeah. that's been really heartbreaking too. Okay. So that's just advice for everybody to okay. pick very carefully who you have around you. Okay, cool. We'll do. Hello. <sighs> once again. What a girl. What a lady, man. What a lady. I want to use that meme of like girls and accountability. And it's like Neo and the accountability is the bullets in the Matrix. 
and start dodging the bullets. That's all it is, isn't it? Women have such a hard job, such a hard time having any level of accountability. And this is one of them. It's always somebody else's fault. <laughs> always, always. I love it. I fucking love it. Godspeed to her. Godspeed to her. Okay, so before we end it, I want to show you guys something super cool that I just received. I've been after these shoes for a while, ever since I've seen the original pictures of them leak online. And I've been really in love with the its silhouette, the design of it, everything about it. Especially nowadays, considering that we live in a retro sneaker market. Everything is retros. There are really no new silhouettes or fresh shapes anymore. Ever since Ye went on that anti-Semite world tour where he unfortunately um, damaged irreversibly his relationship with Adidas, which then led to the end of the Yeezy line, we don't really have any new fresh silhouettes anymore. All we have are retros. Even if it's ASICs and stuff, it's just retro runners with maybe different type, with kind of hybrids, different uppers, different soul units, but it's just retros that are dominating the market at the moment. So whenever I see somebody making a new shoe, a new design, a new shape, I'm all for it. Even if it's something that's not really to my taste, I'm gonna get behind because I think these sneaker designs out here should be encouraged to try and risk taking some chances with some new shapes, new silhouettes, new applications, new processes, and see if that works, as opposed to just taking the conventional Air Force One dunk, Jordan shape and silhouette, and then just kind of reimagining the inners. I don't want that. I want new shapes, new silhouettes. I want stuff to be pushed and be challenged. And maybe in a weird way, some of these smaller independent sneaker footwear brands and companies are gonna be the ones that are gonna force some of the big players to innovate and to give us new new and more interesting things because at the moment sneakerheads aren't going to force them to do that because us sneakerheads must have included we're all sheep we keep buying the stuff we don't really vote with our wallets we don't boycott brands we just keep mindlessly buying retro after retro after retro so all that to be said i've recently got a pair of john geiger's gf4s right john Ge john geiger's john so saying all that, I recently got a pair of John Geiger's 004 sneakers delivered to me just the other day. So shout out to John Geiger in the US 11, the 004s in the black colorway, which I'm really happy about. I didn't mind either colorway. I would have been okay to get the melons, to be completely honest. And I probably will find a way to get the melons myself later on down the line. But I am super stoked that I also got the black pair because I can immediately wear them with all the stuff that I've got anyway. So it comes in this big, nice box, as you can see there already. you got this box that's kind of like in this faux snakeskin um, almost kind of material on the top there. It's almost like a patent type of thing, but it's got the snakeskin embossing there. And you see the John Geiger logo over there as well, which I really like. The John Geiger logo kind of reminds me of like the old, is it Sony Discman logo type of thing? right, with a little sign on top of it, so I'm, I'm a big fan of that, maybe over time, if he becomes more confident with his brand, he could just remove the Geiger, and have the, the symbol itself be him, right, that could just be, that logo could be the symbol, without the Geiger written on there, really chic and clean, I don't mind that, then when you open the box, you've got a really nice dust bag here too, that you can use, which is also features my favourite colour, neon green, brat summer all year, but I've always been a fan of neon green, it's one of my safety, my, my favourite colours of all time, safety green, neon green, fluorescent green, whatever, I'm a big fan of it, so you've got this nice dust bag here, in this cream colour, with the John Geiger logo written on there, and then the shoes come individually wrapped, in nice bits of tissue paper, and then you've got the shoes here, as I'm going to show you, and they're delightful, and actually, I'm not going to lie, they're a lot lighter than I originally thought. I thought these would be way heavier. They're a lot lighter than what they actually look. They look quite heavy, if you see them here, but they actually feel really, really light. I love this sole unit. It reminds me of the NMDs, this kind of bubbled um, midsole here, right? It's really soft as well. I love the outsole, the tread. I love how it runs along the back of the heel all the way up to the front. If I was being picky, if I was being picky, I would have probably liked the whole tread. You know how the tread on the outsole, it's almost like a tire, tire tread, right? Which is really good. It looks like a bicycle tread, maybe like a car tread. It runs along the back of the heel. I would have preferred it when it comes at the front that you run the whole entire tread on this tip here. But instead on the tip, he's got this really nice, I think it's like a nubuck material. I think it's nubuck. I think it might be nubuck here on the front. And then on the top, you just got this mixture of mesh with this, I'm, I'm guessing it's like rubber or plastic on the, up, on the up, which is like this net. And I love it because weirdly enough, the design, I think I mentioned before, 
in, it's a really clever way to add sh like panels to the upper without adding panels. I think we saw it a lot, obviously, with the Yeezy 350s um, that um, Kanye made. It was a bit of a game changer because you got to have like a shoe that had a shape and that didn't have a panel. It was almost like the shape came from like the sole and from the upper design. It kind of gave it a shape. You didn't need to have, because even the NMDs, the original Adidas NMDs, if you remember the original Adidas NMDs, they had the three stripes that kind of gave it a little bit of solidity and a shape. But the original 350s, or the original like Zoom, yeah, I think 300, 350s, right? They were just like a sock liner but he was able to get the shape on them. I don't know how. Maybe there's some sort of trick design-wise I'm not understanding, but I think John Geiger's done the same thing. By having this like net design on the top, you almost give this shoe panels. You give it like a toe box shape. You give it like side panels. You give it all panels with this just, with this like plastic cage on the outside, which is super, super cool. Maybe in the future, there might be an option to have this cage be a little bit more detached so that it kind of, you can kind of tighten the shoe using the cage, that makes sense. So it almost works like flywire. That would be pretty cool. Like imagine if the cage at the top around the eyelets was a little bit loose and came away from the top. So there'd be a way to when you like pull the laces, it kind of tightens and adds tension to the shoe. But regardless, lifestyle wise, I'm a big fan of it. It's got this really nice plush inside. Smells really good on the inside there. I'm not going to lie. It doesn't smell like Chinese factories. Um, nice plush inside there. You've got the nice hit of the orange on the heel tab. You've also got the hit there on the logo at the front. Um, I actually like the mixture there of the logo. Um, different colours there. You've got the orange with that kind of like mini disc logo there. And the green with Geiger. You've got a nice little, uh, what you call it, eyelet thing that you can run the laces through in the middle. I'm probably going to relace them. I don't like to run my laces through these things. But in this particular one, it's kind of raised. As you can see there from the side, those little eyelets and tongue are raised. Usually on some sneakers, they're usually flat. But I guess you're meant to wear them like that. So it kind of gives it shape and gives that little extra pop on the color in the middle. And then um, you've got another pull type here on the back. I also like the detail here of the green. This kind of like Tiffany blue, greeny type of colorway on the back here. Looks really cool. And then you've got a white on the inside. And then the other detail that I really like, it kind of reminds me of the hit that Virgil did on the Jordans. Virgil on the Jordans, if I'm not mistaken, on the Jordan 1s for the 10 collection, there's like a little orange pull tab. And there's also this stitch, this little over stitch that kind of, you, you know, it's a little design touch. It kind of adds a little bit of a pop. Um, I'm sure there's some, there's a rhyme or reason behind it, but I think this touch is really nice. You've got it three times along the side. And if you notice too along the side, there's also a J and a G there, written on the side there. I'm not too sure if the number four is there also, but you do see a J, so over there, you do see a J there, and you do see a G written here as well. So I like that he's incorporated his logo on the side there without doing it in a very over brash way. It's done kind of pretty cool. And you've also got the Otex there on the inside. That's pretty cool there, the little addition there, maybe of the Otex technology. And then on the outsole, you've got the whole JG logo, which again, I would prefer, I'm not gonna lie, the John Geiger logo. I actually prefer if we transitioned into this kind of, like I said, that kind of weird mini disc-esque uh, logo that's on there. I kind of would like that to be the logo going forward, that, that to be his swoosh, that would be pretty sick. And then to have that maybe on the outsole instead of the JG, but still really like it. Nice bit of amount of flex in it as well, but the sole unit and the shot and the feel is super light, a lot lighter than I thought it would be. So I can't wait to wear these. I've got a US 10, I'm typically a US 10 and a half. No, I'm, I'm typically, no, I got a US 11. I'm typically a US 11.5 or a US 12, but sometimes if I get a US 12, the heel slips. And with this particular shoe, with this shape, I would much rather remove the insole and wear them insole-less and have my feet maybe pinch a bit at the front, but then be fit, then have to wear them and my sole flip. Because I would like to wear these with jeans and make them look cute and shit. So I'm happy with the 10s. They are a bit snug, but I can wear them. I don't give a fuck. I've been used to wearing um, shoes that are maybe just my size or under for a long time, so it's not gonna be a worry. But they're really flipping nice. Um, if you want a pair, unfortunately they are sold out. They are completely sold out now and they're going for crazy prices on flipping StockX. But as you can see on the website, there's actually two colorways on the particular shoe. I've got the stealth colorway 
and the melon colorway is actually really nice. I didn't like it at first, but now that John Guy, again, he's been a really good promoter of these shoes. He's been posting them nonstop on his Instagram with all these fucking fancy jeans and fancy shorts and lifestyle pictures, driving his fancy cars in bloody LA and shit, having a good time. And he's made these melon ones look really fucking good. Especially, I can imagine these with like some light denim and stuff, like a light denim suit, like, oh, these will look fucking good. Or maybe just a bright outfit, do you know what I mean? In general, really good combination of greens and a red and an orange. So I'll find a way to get these myself probably, but this is a really good pair. And they've also got them in black. Um, there's also another pair I saw. I think there's a multi-pair, a pair where it's the same color, but I think on the toe box area, it's yellow. Um, and there's also another pair that's also yellow-ish, if I'm not mistaken. So they may be coming out soon if you do want a pair. But unfortunately, they're sold out at the moment. But keep an eye out on JohnGeiger.co. Um, sorry, JohnGeigerCo.com. Or follow him on social media, John Geiger, spelled J-O-N-G-E-I-G-E-R, for all your needs and purposes. I'm really happy that these have gone well. Because, like I said before, but yeah, I wasn't the biggest fan of the John Geiger GF-01s which are his kind of flip of an Air Force One. Obviously, the silhouette is a bit more slim. Um, maybe he would say that in materials are a bit more improved and he has maybe nicer colorways. But I think already the silhouette is done. It's certified as a Nike shoe. I'm not interested in it in the slightest. But I did see a lot more potential in John Geiger vis-a-vis -vis the, the shoe surgeon. Because with John Geiger, I saw some level of creativity and inventiveness and just like thinking outside the box when he made those incredible, I think, incredible customs. Probably one of the only custom shoes that I've ever been a fan of which were the misplay checks that's when i had my faith in him was restored i was like okay cool this guy knows what he's doing and now that he's been able to make these i'm glad my faith was always put in him because i knew there's the guy that can design a custom shoe like this are so simple but yet so effective and it looks so chic and looks so cool where you just take a regular air force one and you just apply additional swooshes on top of the original swoosh in different luxury premium materials and it looks the way that it does especially in the high with the custom strap and stuff i thought that was brilliant way more interesting than the shoe surgeon rebuilding a jordan one in like lizard fucking material i don't give a fuck about that but i thought this showed that he had a level of creativity and inventiveness that would probably lead to a shoe that looks like this so i wasn't surprised when he did eventually come out with a shoe that i was a big fan of and i was really um hopeful that sneakerheads like myself would go out of their way to buy them and sell them out so that it would encourage him to make more of these because he runs a business if he's seeing that people are only buying the gf1s and selling those out i understand why he just keeps copying and pasting the silhouette and doing different colorways why the fuck not cash out you got family to look after it is what it is but now as an artist and as a designer if you're seeing people are ready for new shapes new silhouettes new ideas they they want you to maybe push them and challenge them you're going to start making different iterations of this. And this shoe, personally, I feel like could work amazingly well as a high. Could work amazingly well as a boot. As like a, you know, he could easily change this into like a hiking boot. Into a mid or something. This easily could work as a sort of chucker shape. As a high shape, easily. But this would only happen if you're getting a good response from these selling out. If these sat around and they weren't selling out, you probably would have scrapped it and gone back to just, you know, maybe making uh, Air Max 1 copy or another Air Force 1 copy or whatever it may be. But now these have been made. I hope this gives them the encouragement needed to double down and start double, to, to go a bit further and challenge yourself and make more silhouettes and put those out there because this gives you a reason to not buy a Nike or to not buy an Adidas because it's a different silhouette. Maybe some of you will see it and think it looks like a Sperridon maybe maybe but i think there are so many elements in this and it's so well done that i don't think it looks like any particular shoe particularly out there so you can buy these and wear these and look completely different to everybody out there on the streets who's wearing the same old fucking retros so i do encourage you to check out john geiger he's doing some fresh interesting things these are some really cool shoes i can't wait to wear them unlike other things that i don't wear straight away i am going to be wearing these straight away so i can't wait to put these on and be stunting on them and them outside and shit you know what the deal is you know what the deal is okay people thank you for tuning into the agassino zinger show episode number 799 if it's your first time tuning into the show please make sure you like down below if you're watching this via youtube if you are listening to the podcast app please make sure you leave me a five star review on all of the podcast streaming platforms that's apple that's spotify all those platforms and reviews especially on spotify it's pretty easy you just press the stars you don't have to write anything but please do that that'll definitely help me in terms of going out maybe reaching out to sponsors and trying to get this podcast kind of onto a next level and making this sort of thing full-time that'll be 
be absolutely amazing. Help me if you can. All links to the stories are below in the descriptions. Links to my social media are also there. So do that if you may please. And if you want to contact me, there's a link at the bottom too to contact me and reach out and whatever you can. Feel free. I'll respond to you ASAP. To end the show, my song of the day is going to be the one and only Rima. The song is called Yeo. It's from his new album called Heist. He played recently at Wireless. Absolutely killed it. I recommend you check him out. One of my favorite Afrobeats artists. I've been following him from the very beginning. I love his sound. I love that kind of Indian inspired Afrobeats music that he makes. I love how sinister and how spooky and how euphoric his voice can sound. Um, almost like a UK version of Don Tolliver. His voice inflections can give the beat a menace min, uh, uh, a menacing sinister vibe sometimes it could be uplifting and joyful all of it i flip in love and i love how versatile he is actually as an afrobeats um, artist similar to like a burner boy i don't think afrobeats is a fair even umbrella to put him under i think he's just a global artist and a global you know he, he just makes music actually the good music in general so i recommend you check him out so this song is rima it's called yayo from his new album called heist check it out and i hope you enjoy and i'll see you guys again soon peace